It is indeed an honor to speak before such a distinguished audience about a topic that's so near and dear to my heart. Um, I love the Bahamas and nowhere more so than the Exumas. And I want to tell you a little bit about someone else who also had a great love for the Exumas and started with sustainable practices before most of us knew what sustainability was. And that's sort of the history of the Perry Institute for Marine Science that I want to talk about a little bit and then talk about where we're going. And my vision that I have been gelling in my mind for some time is so in line with this conference that I think the timing is just perfect. John Perry was actually a newspaper man originally, but he fell in love with the sea and he pioneered a lot of undersea research technology in the 1960s, building a number of submersibles. He was key in the founding of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. He created all kinds of equipment uh, in addition to submersibles, remotely operated vehicles, even undersea habitats. And this was a time of great excitement. Jacques Cousteau was being known to the world and inspiring people to live and work under the sea. Mr. Perry was doing this. Hydrolab One was deployed off Grand Bahama for, uh, I think, close to two decades. A lot of research was done there, and then it was moved to St. Croix. Hydrolab Two, much smaller, and that's Mr. Perry in it, is located right off of Lee Stocking Island. He had a commitment to not just the undersea, but using the island there as a test bed for sustainability. Again, he didn't call it that at the time. So let me show you where it is. Of course, we're up here in uh, New Providence. The Exuma Keys run down along the side of Exuma Sound. This is Great Exuma and Little Exuma at the bottom. And Lee Stocking is located just north of Great Exuma Island. There's nothing on the island but the laboratory and its facilities. There's an airstrip. Uh, and this all started to be developed in the 1970s as uh, a research center and also a test bed for energy systems. Now, as a research center for marine studies, it was ideal because we had these deep oceanic waters of Exuma Sound. We had the shallow waters of the banks and virtually every habitat in between. So it's attracted scientists literally from around the world to work in these habitats. So a brief history, we do have some Loyalist era uh, ruins on the island and they may be related to the salt works which was over here on Norman's Pond Key back in the Loyalist time. And that was an interesting use of sustainable technology. I was thinking of using RO rejectate water to, uh, as a head start on making salt. It's already a little saltier, so that's one way of getting rid of that salty water. But anyway, um, there are some ruins in the island that may relate to that, but really nothing was built until Mr. Perry purchased the island in the late 50s. And then he really started getting going in the 1970s with the uh, founding of the Perry Foundation. Today we call it the Perry Institute for Marine Science. And uh, that, as that lab grew, uh, it became established as the Caribbean Marine Research Center in 1984. Many scientists still know us as the CMRC, and so you may hear that term out there. And several years later, we were designated by NOAA, the agency that Mr. Perry helped found, as one of six national undersea research centers. We were the only one not in the United States. All the others were scattered around the country, and their purpose was to bring technology to marine scientists, submersibles, deep dive technology, remotely operated vehicles, make them available to scientists. And so that was uh, the purpose of it, but it also supported a lot of just basic science in the area. And over the 40 years that the Perry Foundation has been in existence, we have a pretty impressive track record. Um, hundreds of institutions have brought thousands and thousands of scientists and students. Uh, many graduate degrees in part or in whole have been uh, finished there. Numerous publications, 
this number climbs every day. We have people that are spending almost all day underwater as we speak right now, are out uh, working on lionfish, working on other issues right now, diving and spending a lot of time underwater. Uh, I'll show you the submersibles that we did have on the island. We don't anymore, uh, but many dives were conducted on the wall that drops right off into Exuma Sound, so we learned a lot about that deep water habitat. And a lot of money has been brought in for research, and of course some of that's trickled into the local economy as well. So I just want to briefly capture some of the projects and you'll begin to see the scope of uh, some of the sustainability uh, items that Mr. Perry was focused on, tilapia aquaculture. This is one of the success stories in aquaculture. You can find tilapia in just about any supermarket or restaurant these days in the States. Alan Stoner conducted a lot of the very seminal work on conch biology and principles of aquaculture as well there. And he's recently come back and uh, uh, spent a little time there cruising this year, but he's also helped inspire a project called Community Conch, which just finished up on the island, uh, repeating surveys of conch that Alan Stoner did 20 years ago. And that group is now in the Exuma Keys Land and Sea Park, again, following up on these historical data. Data. And that's one of the values of lease stocking is we've been there long enough now that we're starting to develop historical data sets. Lobster stock enhancement, uh, aquaculture of lobsters is a little difficult, but stock enhancement is something both with conch and lobster that has a future we can talk about another time. Carbonate geology, not particularly uh, of economic significance, but these structures here are called giant stromatolites and they are a living example of one of the oldest forms of life known. And the discovery of these in 1980s has brought geologists throughout the world to come back to Lee Stocking and they continue to do so. Here's the sub it was talking about. It was a two-person sub that operated out of the lab during the 1990s. Today, we're doing a lot more using technical diving uh, rather than submersibles. It allows you to get right hands-on to things. Of course, you can't go quite as deep, but you can get hands-on and it's much less expensive. We just had a group working down to about 450 feet. We have another group coming in a few weeks that'll be doing 300-foot dives uh, in Exuma Sound. For many years, we had a dive safety officer who some of you may well know of. Uh, this is Brian K. Cook. He's now in Abaco. Uh, last August, uh, National Geographic features the blue holes of the Bahamas, and, and Brian was the dive team leader for that. But he spent many years at Lee Stocking, and uh, he opened my eyes to the habitats around there, but I didn't go in the caves with him. Brian uh, does crazy things in caves, and he's really good at it. This is one on Norman's Pond Key uh, next door that he helped pioneer. Doesn't look like much. There's a few people open. The opening is just a little opening in the rock, but it goes in over 300 feet deep and over a quarter mile back. There are many such caves, and Brian has let, pioneered many of them. We've had scientists such as Dr. Craig Dahlgren, who is on our staff, has done a lot of work on fish uh, and fisheries ecology, as well as Mark Hickson, who is, uh, his team has been coming every year for 20 years from Oregon State. And uh, Mark Hickson is considered one of the leading fisheries ecologists in the world. And right now they're focused on this guy, which we've heard mention of before, the invasive lionfish. And they've been doing some of the seminal work on the effects of that in the Bahamas. Some of the deep diving work is looking at potential biomedical products as well as ecology. Marine protected area design. I myself, as well as Craig Dahlgren and others working out of the lab, have done a lot of work up in the Exuma Keys Land and Sea Park in helping to design marine protected areas and evaluate their effectiveness. I'm basically a coral biologist, so I had to throw this in. Actually, there are many people other than myself that have been doing a lot of really good coral biology, including the effects of uh, global climate change, which are affecting coral reefs throughout the world. Uh, and this is a system that was set up by NOAA. Unfortunately, we lost that funding in 2006 because of 
economic and political realities in the United States. So we still have this stick out there, but there's no instruments on it. So there's an opportunity for someone that wants to help us get back into monitoring global climate change. Education has always been a part of our mission, but it's, it's frankly taken us a, a back seat. And that's something I've been trying to change the last few years. Not just traditional education with college groups. Uh, this is a College of the Bahamas group a number of years ago. Uh, this was University of Wyoming came out two years ago looking at ocean acidification. Uh, but also to get into our, our local schools much more than we have in the past and to do it on a consistent basis. So we have kids come out to the island, sometimes from school, sometimes the boys club, girl guides, and, and when we can't get them out, we go into the classroom as well. We've had a number of teacher workshops, again, something I'm looking at increasing over time to help spread the information that we generate and distribute it to the schools. This is a picture taken a couple of years ago uh, talking about water quality issues and uh, kind of related to the talk we just had with a discharge by cruisers. So this is a particular community that we have in Exuma and, and as well in Abaco and other parts of the Bahamas that is the cruising community. Well, in Elizabeth Harbor, we have several hundred boats congregating there at the peak of the season. And until uh, we had the pump out system last year, most of them were discharging water waste directly into Elizabeth Harbor and in, in that sort of in prepping for that uh, pump out system to come I was just trying to get people to uh, to realize why they needed to do it it's going to cost them some money it's going to cost them some trouble but they need to understand why they can't be discharging their waste into the virtually pristine waters of the Bahamas we have interns from around the world uh, coming constantly. There's always one or two interns there, so that's another aspect of our education program that has influenced many careers and continues to. And then there's educational material. Some of you may have seen this poster series. Uh, the first one was the conch, and there's Nassau Grouper and Lobster. They're distributed not just in the Bahamas, but through much of the Caribbean and throughout Florida, uh, these posters. And we'll continue to add new species of interest as funding allows. So where do we go from here? That's where we've been. Um, and there's certainly some of the things that we've been doing we're going to continue. Uh, our visiting scientist program is, is brings fame to the Bahamas around the world. People know Lee Stocking Island because they know this is one of the best labs in the world. Now, it can be better, but it's still one of the best out there. So we'll continue that. And I certainly want to get in-house research reinvigorated. Since we lost the NOAA funding, we've not had as much ongoing 365-day-a-year uh, kinds of programs. As I mentioned with education, I think it's important to expand our reach uh, into the classrooms as well as hosting field programs on the island. We have a great facility to do it that's been highly underutilized, and education is near and dear to my heart as well. We're looking at establishment of a scholarship fund that will support Bahamian interns and grad students. And we've already had some that have been very notal, notable. Uh, Nikita Shield Roll, whose book you may have seen on the Exumas, was an intern there. And uh, we want to increase this where we're reaching more Bahamians and giving them opportunities to s learn about the sea directly. And it's a great little place for doing conferences and workshops, and I'm going to take this opportunity to make a little blurb. Um, it's, it's not as good for a meeting such as this, but if you want to get 25 people together and really do some work and come out with some products, we found it a very productive environment for that. And we've had a number of uh, small meetings and conferences that are um, just ideal in a more isolated environment and where you're very close to the environment that you're actually trying to do something about. You have that relevance that really brings it home every minute, every day that you're in that meeting. But the real thing that I'd like to sort of bring out today is my vision for sort of recapturing what Mr. Perry did. And I only talked really a little bit about that. I talked about his subs and I talked about the aquaculture that he supported. But there was more going on. Back in the 1980s, this is a picture of the research site. See this wind turbine over here? I think I'm losing, there it is. 
There was also a solar array with 100 panels on it back in the 1980s. Now, it was kind of a little bit before his time, and uh, they worked, and the batteries were cumbersome, batteries are still kind of a, a problem, but he was trying to, to develop alternative energy, alternative food, alternative sources for water. We were using RO when that was also pretty new technology, still use it today. And he actually developed fuel cells that you can purchase today. He sold the technology to Teledyne, you can purchase a Perry fuel cell. So he was working with hydrogen, trying to get fuel from the sea. We kind of lost that along the way, partly due to funding reasons, but I'd like to recapture that and use this as a test bed, not just for doing science, but we have a lot of area on the island that is perfect and we need those sustainable technologies ourselves. So what I'm proposing is something I call the assist programs and they're dealing with four of the five most important things to humans. Somebody will correct me if I'm wrong, but I know air is missing from this intentionally because at least in the Exuma Keys, our air quality is excellent. We really don't have a problem with that. In, in, in Nassau, that may be a different issue. Uh, but these systems will all deal with these critical things. And then I'm gonna sort of lay out a little design challenge at the end that integrates them all. Uh, first of all, starting out with some real workshops, not talk shops, but workshops where you come away with tangible products for designs and engineering, specifically for these island environments. And have an island where you actually test these. We get products from the states all the time, bring them out to the island, they disappear into a pile of oxidation within a period of months or a year. Or certain rubber compounds, even not being out in the sun, turn into mush. This is a real environment, and we can tell you that the rates of entropy on lace stocking are higher than most places in the world. So that means things tend to degrade. We can test them in a real world environment there. Uh, and then actually passing on this technology to Bahamians first and eventually perhaps other islanders in the form of uh, training workshops on the island where they're building systems, learning how to operate systems and then leaving the island and doing that in their communities. That technology transfer, I think, could be, go beyond the Bahamas, certainly to other island groups. We're not talking about just train, training Azumians. We might start with that, but it would go eventually throughout the Caribbean. There's no reason why we couldn't bring in students for uh, training sessions for a week or two and have them go back and bring sustainable technology throughout the Caribbean. So this is my little design challenge for, the, uh, for those that are architects and thinking about a systems approach. Mine tends to be more distributed than centralized and I think that's more appropriate for the Exuma Keys where we don't have an urban environment. Some centralization on Great Exuma may have its scale uh, dependent uh, benefits, but the idea of the Exuma house is not really a single house, it's a modular concept that can be used for small buildings that are very commonly used in the Keys. Cottages, which we can use on the island for a guest scientist or a motel can use for guests. Uh, small homes, two to three bedroom and, and small office buildings. And as I see it, if I were designing it, it would be a structurally integrated panel uh, construction and actually train people and set up local facilities to create these panels. It's relatively low tech. You can use standardized materials and you can make them relatively inexpensively. So you can get people really working the whole product cycle of this building from constructing the panels uh, to building the whole structure and then operating it. Now, this island environment, these are the realities of the Exumas. You've got to be hurricane resistant, because we do get them once in a while, so it's got to be sustainable from weather. Rot, insect, corrosion, big factor. I mean, you can't, there's so many parts that we put into house, windows, et cetera, that are not designed for these high salt uh, environments, and you end up replacing them. Uh, and then also to have something that is cheap and easy to maintain, like maybe no paint systems, have your SIP panels made with integrated colors in them so they're not painting them. A lot of these things that can really increase sustainability over time. 
Um, design and siting to optimize passive cooling. We've gotten within two generations addicted to air conditioning, yet in the Exumas we have almost every day beautiful breezes. And if you only site and design your house appropriately, they're very comfortable to live in. Uh, now there will be places where sites aren't amenable to that, but it, then you can have an efficiently designed building with a lot of insulation to optimize air conditioning efficiency. And then, of course, you want all the sustainable systems. Um, with respect to water, again, in a distributed system, I like cisterns. I think their problem is they're too small. We have plenty of rain in the Bahamas. It's just a temporal issue. It only comes at certain times, so you need to be able to store it for the dry times. So an investment in a larger cistern can provide all the water you really need. And of course, electric, I'm not, uh, I, I, you notice I don't have wind in there. I think wind has is, is got its place for certain things. We certainly have pretty good breezes. But when you have moving parts in a high salt environment, and then you also have the aesthetic effects. Uh, Minister DeVoe mentioned Over Yonder, and unfortunately, I, I knew the former owners of Over Yonder who had a very nice, low-key home on it. And now it looks like a porcupine bristling with very cool, you know, but unfortunately ugly um, alternative energy. Uh, and then, of course, other systems as well. So. Um, I'd like to use this sort of as a, a, a catalytic, catalytic element of it is starting small and working up to the, the bigger community. We'll certainly be focusing with our research on the marine sustainability as well, but I think it's important for all of us to think about the human element, and as scientists we have to address that as well. Uh, and we'd like a sustainable environment. It's a little embarrassing to have them come, and I know some of you are coming on a field trip Saturday and hear a diesel generator running. It will be the best day of my life when I can shut that thing down. So thank you, and uh, I look forward to any questions later on.